Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, it's Monday, which means it's time for McDougal Monday, where we are joined by Dr. John McDougal and his wife, Mary. And he is gonna be giving a brand new lecture based on the gastrointestinal system, GI health. He's gonna do part one today and part two in two weeks. And today he's gonna to focus on the upper GI tract. Now I'm sure you know that Dr. McDougall has multiple best-selling books and you're probably familiar with his book, The Starch Solution or The McDougall Program for Maximum Weight Loss. Many of his books are wonderful, but my favorite might be Digestive Tune-Up. So he really does, because it's got pictures in it and it's really fun to read. So he really does know a lot about your GI health, and he's here to talk about it. Please welcome Dr. John McDougall. People voted that they really wanted to hear this topic from you. Well, thank you, uh, AJ. I, I think it's, it's a really important topic after all. You know, everything everything that happens to you starts with your intestinal tract. And, uh, you know, that the, the intestinal tract is the portal of entry of most of our environment. You know, the other way we get our environment to enter it to us is we breathe it. You know, that through the lungs, we absorb some of the environment. Of course, you can easily think about contaminated air and cigarette smoke and decide that that's a portal that can be easily damaged by poisons and toxins, particularly if you happen to be a tobacco user. But, you know, a marijuana user or somebody who lives downwind from a factory, we're talking about uh, injury that way. But otherwise, uh, essentially all of the other contact you have with your environment is through your gastrointestinal tract. And what we're talking about here is food and water. But I'm gonna be discussing the food issues with you right now. You know that you need clean air and uh, clean water and uh, you need clean food too. And uh, what I've been spending my lifetime trying to, trying to come up with is uh, what is the food that allows you to look and feel your best, to function your best, to live your longest? You know, what would that diet be? And you know, I, I think, well, let's just put it this way. I'm happy with what I came up with more than 46 years ago. You know why I'm happy is because when I prescribe this kind of, uh, of eating to people is they come back and they say, I, you know, it's a miracle. Uh, thank you very much. You know, I, I just didn't cost me anything. It's uh, cut my food bill dramatically. And boy, everything you promised, I got. And I, this is what I promise you is that if you have dietary diseases caused by the Western diet, which is what 80% of the people have in our society, then if you stop that poisoning, the rich Western diet, the meat, any, any animal products at all, be they secretions or animal parts, and the oil, you know, this is not, this is not part of the human diet. I know, I know the dairy industry and meat industry have taught us all differently but it's not true. And it's been recently that the, uh, that the fishing industry has taught us that in order to be healthy and to have a good heart and a good brain, we've got to destroy the fish population. No, that's not true either. So what I want to talk to you about over the next, uh, well, couple sessions is I want, I want to talk to you about the intestinal tract and we'll do the upper end, then we'll do later on the lower. And hopefully I'll stimulate some questions uh, for, from you uh, about this particular topic. When I, when I decided to write Dr. McDougall's Digestive Tune-Up, which I wrote, was published in the year 2007. So what is that? That's 15 years ago. Yeah, still a national bestseller. You could get it on Amazon. Uh, the, the, it's an active bestseller. I mean, the book company has not given me the title back like it has with a few other, other of my books. Yeah, they still make a, uh, a lot of money off the book. And it, it was tough when I decided to write this because I mean, the intestinal tract, I mean, this, this is a, 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 an area of the body that's shrouded in mystery. And also it's considered by and large dirty, isn't it? Shameful. You, 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 don't, you don't want to talk about your bowels, but they need to be talked about. And um, so I took the big step and, and decided to write a book. And, and, and I actually got a comedy writer to help me with this book because I figured we had to introduce a little bit of humor in it. And, that's not really all that funny, but people tell me that they are able to read it from cover to cover and without putting it down and they enjoy it. And boy, boy, that was, that was a compliment. I didn't know that I would, would do that well when I started out deciding to write this book. And uh, I, also, I also got a lot of help here from 
a good friend of mine, actually, he started out being a, a patient that I, that I uh, made contact with over the internet. And this is him right here. This is, this is my friend, Howard Bartner. And he did the illustrations for the book. And the illustrations you're going to see today were done by Howard Bartner. Howard Bar Bartner was the, the head of medical illustration for the National Institutes of Health. That's what he did his whole life. He just drew pictures for doctors and scientists. And this is a self-portrait of Howard. But when I first made contact with Howard, he was uh, in a hospital room. And he wrote me and he said, well, you know, I've read your books and I know lots of doctors. So I, I spend my, my life with doctors, you know, drawing pictures for them. So I've gotten to know them pretty well. And boy, I, I'm in big trouble. I've got high blood pressure. I've got heart disease. They want to do heart surgery on me. You know, is there any way I can get out of this? I said, look, Howard, you know, I'm not your doctor, but, you know, like most of you, I write you back and tell you what to do. So Howard decided that he was going to sign himself out against advice. And after a few days, he was going to have the heart surgery and went home, changed his diet. And like pretty much everybody I can imagine or think about or remember, he got well, you know, because he stopped the food poisoning. His arteries cleaned out, his blood pressure came down. He did really, really well. Well, Howard, uh, he got together with me on this book to make the book a lot more enjoyable, entertaining, and educational. And so the drawings are his. The first time I met Howard was on one of our adventure trips to, um, to Alaska. And he and his wife uh, came on this trip. And, and the first time we ever got together personally. And uh, actually, this is what motivated him to do the drawings for me is uh, on this particular trip, on this boat, we did not have a projector. You know, we used to use projectors to use slides. Well, there's no projector and there was no screen and there wasn't even any, I don't think any electricity in the lounge. So I was done as far as being able to show slides. And so what I had to do is I had to draw. And I, so I got a white piece of paper out and I, I drew the things that I wanted people to see. And here's Howard the head of the, uh, of the medical arts division of the National Institutes of Health, watching me draw these pictures. And my, my artwork is worse than Doug Lyles. Just to give you some idea of how, how, how he was, he was uh, so upset that I would you know, present my important material this way. But Howard, that's all I had. So anyway, he, he agreed to, uh, to do the illustrations with it. But I, you know, I remember Howard very well. And, you know, one morning we're, we're standing out in the on the early in the morning, standing on the deck of the ship, and we're watching the ice flows go by and the seals that are laid out all on the ice flows. Just a beautiful, beautiful scene in nature. And I said to Howard, I said, "Look, you know, you're doing really good, aren't you?" He says, "Yeah." He says, "You know, I got myself out of heart surgery, and and um, I don't have any more chest pain, and I feel good, and all my numbers are better." And I said, "Well, you're off all your pills too, aren't you, Howard?" And he says. He says, no, I'm not. I said, well, look, I told you, you should stop all your blood pressure pills. You don't have high blood pressure anymore. He said, yeah, I know. I don't have any high blood pressure anymore. He said, but I'm not going to stop my last blood pressure pill. And the reason, John, is this. He says, I, uh, the, the doctor prescribed me as one of my best friends. And, and I, I countered everything else he wanted me to do and didn't do it, you know, for me to, to uh, stop the last pill. I'm afraid I'll offend him. I'll ruin our friendship. And I said, well, I understand how you feel, Howard, but you're taking a calcium channel blocker, which increases your risk of heart disease and cancer and suicide and good grief. I mean, it can't be that good of a friend. And he said, well, he is. So I said, I tell you what, Howard, why don't you do this? Why don't you take the pill every morning, put it in your mouth, don't swallow it, swish it around a little bit and spit it in the sink and let it go out with the wastewater. He said, yeah, that's a good idea. Then I will have to, I won't have to tell him I'd stop taking the pill. Well, I said, no, you won't, Howard. He said, but you know, I'm not going to do it here. He said, because I know where that wastewater goes. He said, I'm not, I'm not going to poison the seals and the fish. And ladies and gentlemen, now this is a strong message from Howard and my, myself to you, is if you have medications left over, and you will when you change your diet, you'll have pretty much all of them ready for the wastebasket. Don't throw them in the sink or in the toilet. The, these are toxic. These, these, the estrogens femi feminize the fish. You know, all kinds of terrible things go on as a result of the, the medications that people dump in the toilet. 
take them to take them to the pharmacy where there's a toxic waste dump. That's how they need to be disposed of. Anyway, that that's Howard, great man to say the least. So to make this an enjoyable trip, I employed two patients, Larry and Louise. Uh, Larry and Louise will take us through a trip to the gastrointestinal tract and show us some of the things that are going on. Uh, first thing I'd like to share with you is that the the gastrointestinal tract is a long tube. It's about about 38 feet long. Goes from the mouth to the to the anus, and uh, this tube is important for you to understand. Lies outside of the body, and, and as a result, this tube, the surfaces of this tube, are in contact with the environment directly. Now, let me let me explain this a, a little bit a little bit easier to understand is. When, when you were in uh, uh, floating in the inner tube on the lake, uh, when you were floating in the inner tube, you weren't inside the inner tube, were you? No, you were, you were still outside of the of the inner tube, the rubber. To get in the inner tube, you had to pierce the rubber of the inner tube to get inside. And so it is with the intestinal tract. This this long tube lies outside of the body, which explains to you why the intestinal tract gets well so quickly. And why, when we go out and we do things that aren't so good for ourselves, we get something called McDougal's Revenge. Immediately, within minutes to hours. And I think some of you know what McDougal's Revenge is. Anyway, uh, this is the tube we're going to be talking about. I, I'd like to divide this discussion into three parts. And we'll talk about two of the parts uh, today and the last part, not our next time together. I want to talk to you about the upper intestinal tract, which goes from the lips down through the chest cavity, through a tube called the esophagus, uh, into the stomach. And there I want to talk to you about some organs that lie uh, in this particular vicinity. They are the liver and the gallbladder, which is right here. And then we'll go on maybe a little bit about the small intestine, but we'll talk about the large intestine the next time around. Uh, the uh, intestinal tract begins with the mouth. And most people realize what you put in your mouth determines whether the mouth is healthy or diseased. Why? Because you've been told by dentists that sugar causes cavities, and it does. The uh, simple sugars, uh, they uh, reside in the mouth after we eat them, and there's certain bacteria that actually destroy enamel. And, and these bacteria will start the cavity process. Well, you may end up losing some teeth this way. And so, of course, you need to keep your sugar intake low because sugar causes cavities. Now, you can also brush right after you eat a sugary dessert or candy or whatever. You, you, can, you can brush your teeth. That helps. That gets some of the sugar out of the mouth. And, of course, you can just, if you don't have a toothbrush, you can just rinse with water. And, and you'll remove a tremendous amount of sugar from around the teeth. And that should be a good habit practice for you. Uh, the, uh, the teeth, they run into problems uh, such as uh, loose teeth due to the bone around the tooth becoming degenerated. And this, this occurs for the same reason and at the same rate as bone loss occurs throughout the rest of the body. You know, we talk about bone loss in the spine, and bone loss in the hips, and, you know, the extremities, and we call it osteoporosis or osteopenia. Well, the same thing happens in the dental area, your, your mandible and your maxilla. Uh, they're bones, and it's bones at which the teeth sit into. And through a lifetime of eating the rich Western diet that's very acidic, you end up dissolving the bones all throughout the body, including the bones in your maxilla and mandible. In other words, your jaws. So we've talked about this uh, before, but I'll just give you a quick rundown of how this occurs is when you eat the Western diet, you eat a diet high in animal foods. Animal foods are promoted because they're loaded with protein. Protein is a big sales pitch, even though there's never been a case of protein deficiency ever described. That's how they sell products to you. Well, proteins are made of amino acids. Okay, there, there are 20 different amino acids that make up all the proteins in nature. Now, the human being can make 12 of these amino acids, so they're, they're, they're the non-essential ones. You, we don't have to have those in the food, but eight of, them, eight of them we have to have in our food, so they're called essential. 
Well, these amino acids, they're acids, acids. And the protein itself, when you, you know, look at the meat or the cheese or whatever, uh, and you say, take a pH stick and rub it over the surface of these particular animal foods, they, they actually test alkaline. It's only after the digestion of the protein, which occurs in the intestinal tract, that these proteins are broken down into amino acids. And animal foods have a very high content of sulfur-containing amino acids, cysteine and methionine, they're known as. And uh, these sulfur-containing amino acids, they break down into sulfuric acid. So you dump this huge acid load in the body, the primary buffering system of the, of the body is the bones. And the bones dissolve or release alkaline material. And that's the beginning of loss of bone material. Uh, more of it occurs, more of the mechanisms occur down at the kidney level. And it just, you end up urinating your bones in the toilet, including the bones in your mandible and maxilla. Uh, there's a lot of infection that occurs around the teeth from poor dental hygiene. And some of the, uh, the efforts of poor dental hygiene, some of the, it, the indications of it is when you go to the dental hygienist and the dental hygienist takes this little probe and sticks it between your teeth and your gums and calls out numbers like two, four, six. What, what the dental hygienist is talking about is the millimeters that are millimeters uh, that form the pockets. In other words, if you have big pockets between the gum and the teeth, you know, they go deep, six millimeters. You know, two millimeters this is what they're supposed to be. Anyway, you get this, uh, this loss of attachment of the gingival tissues, the gums to the teeth, and you get an infection called gingivitis. And the gum disease may get so bad that the dentist, your dentist sends you off to the oral surgeon to have gum surgery. Well, let me hear, be here to tell you that most of you won't have to do that. As long as you start taking good care of your teeth and eating well. You know, the, the diet has a tremendously very important effect on the whole mouth, not just the teeth. And it's not just the sugar, it's the whole composition of the diet. You know, when you eat a diet for your kitty cats, which is what the American diet is, it's a carnivore diet, you end up uh, not supporting the health of the, of the mouth and teeth. You know? Anyway. Uh, if you will, if you will, just be a little patient, change your diet, and practice good dental hygiene. That means we've seen it, seeing the hygienist. Uh, let the hygienist uh, clean some of these pockets out, and uh, do daily cleaning between your teeth. Now, I know many of you like to floss. I, I never enjoyed flossing, but I've discovered a, a more effective way to clean between the teeth. This is what I use. What I encourage you to try. And these are intradental brushes. And they're little bottle brushes that you buy in the drugstore or on the internet, just little tiny brushes that you stick between your teeth and you will clean out a tremendous amount of particulate matter. In fact, more so than you'll ever get with flossing. And, and I think there's a reason why, and that is that flossing is not natural. Uh, think about it, you can even think about it, our ancestors, uh, they would gather around the, uh, the, the fire pit and, uh, eat, eat their dinner together, and then they would leave after chewing on hopefully corn, and beans, and rice, etc. And and not 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 the hunt. The hunt, of course, is an exaggeration. They didn't eat very many animal products. All these ancestors didn't. But on the way back to their their hut from from the community uh, fireplace, is they had stuff between their teeth and. What, what did they find to pick up along the path to clean between their teeth? They didn't find floss. What they found is little sticks to poke between their teeth. That, that, that's, I think, is the natural way to clean between your teeth is little sticks like these interdental brushes that I told you about. Anyway, you can make a tremendous amount of improvement by, uh, by you know, seeing the dentist, seeing the dental hygienist and putting some good food in your mouth. Let's talk about uh, bad breath. Uh, there's advertisements on TV that I think we should pay attention to. Uh, this is for something called smart mouthwashes. And what they tell you is that all bad breath is caused by sulfur. Well, they're trying to sell a product that neutralizes the sulfur in your breath. And that's why they sell smart mouth, mouthwashes. It's because that's what this particular mouthwash does, it neutralizes sulfur. 
The sulfur stinks. Uh, it is one of the more offensive smells that, uh, that uh, we're exposed to. You, you think about rotten eggs, that, they, that's sulfur. You think about the, uh, uh, about the uh, mud pits, you know, the, the boiling pits at Yosemite or, you know, or uh, Yellowstone National Park. And, you know, they, they're sulfur pits and they stink. Well, that, that's the most offensive odor that we are exposed to is this odor of sulfur. And uh, odor is very important as far as, uh, as far as our ability to communicate with other people. <clears throat> you know this because the perfume industry, that's, that's their business is to sell you different forms of odors that cover up the stink that people naturally have, primarily from the food they eat perfumes and deodorants and colognes and, you know, to cover up that foul smell, to cover up that sulfur. Well, the perfume industry knows that this has to do with romance. If you get the right smell, you know, you're attracted to other people, male or female. So uh, this is important to understand is that that the uh, reason that you are affected is because odor, which has come through here, the nose, it affects these little hairs here. These are actually little tiny nerves. And these are connected to a, 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 a part of the brain. This is not just a nerve. This is a part of the brain called the olfactory lobe. Okay, so you have direct connection with the air to these little hairs, these little nasal hairs. They go into nerve fibers. You can see them right here the olfactory lobes, and then they up into this part of the brain, which is called the limbic system. This is called the limbic, this is where emotion occurs. This is where love and sexual attractiveness and hunger, and this is your limbic system. And so it connects your, what you smell connects directly to these kind of very personal sensations. And if you smell bad, smelling bad, like sulfur, that indicates that you're sick. And so odor is one way you do decide who, what, what people you want around you. And when you're dealing with reproductive issues between a man and a woman, this odor helps you choose who you want to share your sperm or eggs with to produce the, 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 most, uh, the best offspring. That's, that's the importance there. And, and that's one of two ways that you can get clues of the health of a potential mate. The other is vision. You know, overweight people who look sickly, they're, they're not the ones that you choose to mate with. Likewise, people will smell like they're sick or dying, which you do smell like when you eat the Western diet. They're not the people that you, you wanna choose to mate with. But this extends into all kinds of other relationships, business relationship, um, you know, whether or not you get into school, what kind of grades you get into school would be your state of health as perceived by sight and smell. So you're trying to choose uh, in your community. You know, this is not, this is, they're not sexual relationships, they're platonic relationship. You're still trying to choose healthy people to work with, to go to school with, you know, and this is the way you choose these folks is by odor. All right, so you got that part, how important the smell is. The next question you have is, where does this stink come from? Where does this sulfur come from? Sulfur is an element. It is neither created nor destroyed. Okay, you mean, remember that from your basic science. It's not created or destroyed. So it has to come from someplace. Well, where it comes from is the food. And if you compare the, the sulfur content of various foods, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. If you compare beef, same number of calories, same amount of protein, with pinto beans, Beef has four times more sulfur than just pinto beans. You compare eggs uh, to corn, four times as much sulfur. Cheddar cheese has five times as much sulfur as white potatoes and chicken seven times as much sulfur as rice. And tuna fish provides 12 times as much sulfur as sweet potatoes. So you can choose how much of this noxious odor you want to have go into your body. And this... This determines how you smell from head to toe. Uh, you know, one of the places that we notice the odor is in bad breath. 
you, know, you think, well, you clean your mouth very carefully and you use the smart mouthwash and et cetera. You think you've solved the bad breath problem. You haven't. You haven't because these sulfur-containing foods are swallowed. They go through the intestinal tract. They're absorbed uh, through the intestinal tract into the bloodstream. The blood circulates back to the lungs. And with each breath, you exhale the smell. You can't get rid of it just by cleaning your mouth. You've got to stop the sulfur content of your whole body. And this sulfur, it circulates through the bloodstream after it enters through the intestinal tract and goes to your skin. And as it comes out on the surface of your skin. That's how you get body odor. And as we'll say for our discussion at the end, is uh, these sulfur, these sulfur elements, they cause you to have bad farts, stink. Anyway, change your diet. All right, let's talk about another section of the upper intestinal tract. And let's talk about uh, after we left the mouth, uh, we enter something called the esophagus. The esophagus is this long tube that goes to the chest, all right? So the way you get the food through the chest cavity into the abdominal cavity is through this tube called the esophagus. And this esophagus, it attaches to the stomach. All right. There is a sphincter here called the lower esophageal sphincter. You probably learned about this because you've learned about GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And you've learned that this uh, sphincter becomes incompetent. All right, in the next session we have, I'll tell you how it becomes competent, why it is incompetent. But between meals, what's supposed to happen is the muscular band here is supposed to contract and keep the, the stomach contents in the stomach. But what happens is the sphincter, it becomes incompetent. And as a result, the stomach contents, they reflux up into the esophagus. And it burns the esophagus, you get esophagitis. It burns it badly, you get, uh, you get uh, Barrett's esophagitis. And then through constant irritation, you may end up with one of the more untreatable cancers. They're all pretty much untreatable, but this is one of the really, really bad ones to get. It's called adenocarcinoma of esophagus. That's, that's a tough disease. Anyway, the, uh, the reflux continues uh, up into the lower esophageal area all the way up and it refluxes back into the mouth. Okay, so when it refluxes the stomach contents full of acid, digestive substances, when it refluxes on your uh, larynx, which is an organ right here, you get hoarseness and you get a chronic cough. When this material gets refluxed up onto your teeth, you lose the enamel on your teeth and it gets refluxed up in your sinuses and it causes sinusitis. And when you breathe, you inhale the stomach contents down into your lungs and it gives you bronchitis, bronchoconstriction called asthma. And you know, almost all doctors know this, that, that um, asthma is caused, and a good share of people, not almost all people, by this reflux problem. And, you know, doctors will give you advice on how to handle it. And one advice they should give is they should tell you to take advantage of gravity. So at night, when you lay down, you should have your, the head of your bed propped up. I don't mean bent, okay? I mean like that propped up. And what you do is you put a couple of four inch blocks under the, the two head posts that are in your bed and you raise yourself up so that gravity pulls pulls this, uh, this stuff that's being refluxed back into the stomach. So that's standard advice. Other advice is given for you to put on to, to consume antacids. And we'll get a chance to talk about that in a couple of minutes probably. But the main way, the main way that you can solve this problem is you can stop eating foods that are digested by all this acid. A cat has seven times as much concentration of acid in the cat's stomach as opposed to our stomach. Why? Because the cat's diet is meat. He's a carnivore. So when we eat meat, we draw upon the stomach to produce a lot more acid. So a way to get rid of this irritating component of the stomach juices is to stop eating the animal foods. Dairy 
it produces a tremendous amount of acid, not just because of the protein, but because of the calcium in dairy products. And so you stop the dairy and that stops the indigestion. I, I wanna just mention at this point, kind of a side note for you. And that is there are certain foods on our diet that cause intestinal distress, gastritis, maybe even esophagitis. And these are raw vegetables, particularly onions, Greek peppers, cucumbers, and radishes, raw vegetables. And so if you're having problems with your stomach indigestion, esophagitis, et cetera, eat cooked food and stay away from onions, green peppers, cucumbers, and radishes, which by the way, once you cook them, they're not so irritating. I, I can remember seeing patients in the afternoon at our program in Santa Rosa and We'd, we'd have on usually Tuesdays, we'd have burgers, uh, burgers produced by Jeff Novick and ver burgers produced by Mary. It'd be a contest. They see who makes the best burger, but they would serve raw onions. And I loved raw onions, but boy, did they not love me. And so I'd spend the rest of the afternoon in distress trying to see my patients. Well, finally, I was able to communicate to the kitchen staff that they needed to cook the onions and then serve them as cooked onions. And when you heat the onions, whether you heat them by microwave or by fry pan or boil them or whatever you do, you, uh, you cause a couple of volatile substances to be burnt off. And so they're no longer irritating. Anyway, so let's, let's uh, get back into the stomach here. Uh, in the stomach, you have uh, uh, the first part of digestion. Well, the first part of digestion actually starts with the saliva in your mouth with the amylases. Amylases are designed to digest starch. And uh, the next thing you go to is you go to the stomach fat, which is an acid in which you digest protein. As I mentioned, it's not very good at digesting protein. It's not like your cat or carnival. Well, there's a, a popular theory out there that it's not just a theory, it's, it's truth in medicine. The, the, the people who discovered it got the Nobel Prize for the discovery that uh, a lot of stomach problems, particularly ulcers, and even some stomach cancers require a bacterial infection called Helicobacteria pylori or H. pylori. And so uh, as a result, we, you know, scientists discovered that you have to have this bacterial infection to get this kind of gastritis and ulcers, et cetera. Well, you know, that led to a couple of things. One, the observation that H. pylori infection is almost universal around the world. And if you look at uh, less developed countries than the United States, essentially everybody's infected with this bacteria, but not everybody gets ulcers. In fact, the incidence of ulcers in these countries is little to none. It requires an addition to this bacteria. It requires the wrong food for you to get the irritation to get to the point where you develop stomach ulcers. Now, the treatment in common practice is a, they call it a triple therapy, where they give you two proton pump and oh, two antibiotics along with a proton pump inhibitor. And, and it does heal the ulcers. You know, the antibiotics kill the bacteria and the, uh, the proton pump inhibitor it cuts down on the acid. So they do heal the ulcers and you take this therapy for about 10 days, but guess what? You know, as long as you keep eating the same diet, what happens is, the bacteria re regrow, they're all over in our environment. So you get reinfected. So the, the way you really fix the stomach is by changing the contents. You just starch based diet that happens to have no animal products and no added oils, and then you've solved the problem. All right, so here we are in the stomach, okay? We're in the stomach right here. Larry and Louise are taking us through. And we go to the pylorus, which is the first part of the small intestine. And attached to that first part of the small intestine are a couple of ducts. You see them right here? Uh, there's the common bile duct. And then there's a duct that goes to the pancreas. The common bile duct, which is a heavier green one, it, it drains the liver. The liver is important because it's an organ that detoxifies, plus it makes bile acids. Now, I want you to remember this. The liver makes bile acids. We're going to talk about it in our next discussion. The liver makes bile acids and the intention of the bile acids is to digest fat. That's what their purpose is, to digest fat. Well, so the liver makes these, uh, these bile acids, so they have a whole bunch of 
of uh, chemicals and stuff that have been removed by the filtering organ of the liver and the bile acids, which digest the fat. And they flow out of this kind of a tree here uh, into this common bile duct. And then they go into the intestine where the fat is because you just ate a high fat meal and they squirt all over the food. All right, but that, that's when you eat. When you eat, what happens is, is uh, the bile acids go in here, they go in here as a consequence, primarily of this sac, which stores the bile acids, squeezing, this is a gallbladder. So between meals, between meals, there's no need for any bile acid to be in the intestine, okay? So the little sphincter here, it's called the sphincter of Odi, closes down and the gallbladder relaxes. And then when we eat, particularly fatty foods, the gallbladder contracts and Odi opens up, all right. So the purpose of the gallbladder is to act as a storage organ for the bile acids that are made by the liver. But the storage organ, the gallbladder, it gets diseased. It gets uh, inflamed, irritated because of the unhealthy type of bile acids that are produced when you eat the rich Western diet. And it, uh, these, these, uh, the, the bile acid fluid that's produced when you eat the Western diet is, uh, is super saturated with cholesterol. Again, every doctor knows this is the hallmark of forming gallstones is the fact that the bile is super saturated with cholesterol. Well, you know, cholesterol only comes from animal foods in any significant amount. So the reason you're super saturate your bile with cholesterol is because of the food Gallstones are made primarily by, with cholesterol. That's the primary component. And then these are the gallstones you get. How, how many people have gallstones? Well, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50% of people have gallstones when they get to be in their midlife. And, and we have an acronym that uh, we use in medicine, which was taught when I was a student. I'm still taught today. Who, who's more likely to get gallstones? Well, it's female fat, 40, and flatulent. That's the acronym. In other words, overweight women who, are, who eat the Western diet, female fat, 40, you know, middle age, fertile, you know, that particular age group, they're, they're the ones that get the most of the gallstones, maybe half the population that is overweight female in the reproductive years, they, they, get, uh, they have gallstones present. All right, so the gallstones result in the removal, you just cut this little piece out here, which is the cystic duct. Okay, and now, now you no longer have a gallbladder to drain into the common duct that drains into the small intestine. Well, you know, once you get rid of the storage sac, then what happens is the bile drips continuously into the small intestine. I want you to remember that because we're gonna talk about that later on, so next, next time we get together. Okay, you know, I have the storage sac, so the bile continues to drip here. And that causes irritation of the intestinal tract, as we're going to talk about, which results in di chronic diarrhea. And it also causes a, an increased risk of right-sided right colon cancer because these bile acids are irritating to the colon. And as a result of the irritation, you get more cancer. All right. So uh, let's just uh, talk a little bit more about this gallbladder thing. Uh, you, uh, about half of you will be found to have gallstones you'll have a sonogram done for some unrelated reason or an x-ray done and, or you'll have some stomach discomfort and the doctor will do a gallbladder test on you. And you'll find whether it's related to your gallbladder or not, you'll, you'll find that you have gallstones. What do you do about it? Well, this has been well studied. And what the studies consistently show is you're better off leaving the gallstones alone. If you decide to have, once you discover them, to have immediate surgery compared to those who delay surgery, those who have immediate surgery have a greater risk of dying and suffering from complications related to the surgery. So don't do it. Leave your gallstones where they are, as long as they don't hurt you. If they hurt you, the time on our treatment for gallbladder pain is a low fat diet. And it, almost always it goes away. The, the discomfort. And also what causes the gallstones in the first place is stopped. So your next question is, will these dissolve? Well, yes and no. 
there's a, a bile acid product called Actigol that you can take that dissolves the gallstones. But this has gone out of favor. It was very popular 20, 25 years ago. It's gone out of favor because once you treat people who have gallstones with Actigol and they disappeared, they came back. Well, why do you think they came back? It's because you're still eating the diet that super saturates the bile with cholesterol. So if you're gonna take that step to take Actigol, and I don't advise it, you gotta change your diet too, so you stop the reformation of the gallstones. Anyway, leave the gallstones alone, and give, you the, give a medical student something to play with when they do their anatomy lessons. All right, we're gonna end here, we're gonna open up for questions and we'll invite Mary over to get involved and lighten up the conversation. But uh, next what happens is you go through the small intestine and the small intestine is very healthy. It, it's a place where everything's absorbed. All the vitamins, the minerals, the carbohydrates, the proteins, the fats, everything is absorbed in this uh, 28 feet of small intestine. And then what's left over, what's not absorbed, goes into the large intestine, which is where we'll pick up our conversation the next time.